Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Let's Play Creatures Such As We with Trillian. I'm Trillian, and we are back. We are still on the same screen that we left. We have to choose what we're going to do now about uh, our boss, Head Director Marcel. Um, hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. So she's saying uh, uh, we need to speak privately in my office. Now, your stomach trembles. That only means trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't like talking a boss either you know um but she sounds so chipper <laughs> i mean she sounds fine so maybe it's okay um right away send a replacement to watch the tourists no no because they might like someone else better than me and i still want them to make a game out of me so <laughs> we're we're not letting anyone get between me and collected games um i think it might look bad if i left the tourists now can't you just tell me what it is oh that all seems bad let's just go with right away that is always the right answer for your boss right away Marcel seems pleased but you're not this is not the kind of work environment that you should be having to deal with still it would be nice if Marcel was taking this grant problem off your hands hopefully that's what this is all about now comes the tough part how should you deal with leaving the tourists you don't want them to suspect that something's off um Oh, right, because they're doing their observatory thing, right? Um, yeah, let's set them up with the documentary. Sorry I wasn't reading all the things, but inform them that you'll be back. Wait for your replacement. Set them up with a documentary or just leave. I, let's, let's do that. Let's treat them like children. Put them in front of the magic babysitter box. You send them a text message to their HUD informing them that they can bring up documentaries within the booths if they want. The chairs are amazingly comfortable, at least in lower gravity, and it's not uncommon for some guests to fall asleep in them while watching TV. You slip away to the security office. You walk in, glancing over to the wall bank of monitors and system controls. You do not envy the job of managing close quarters quarrels between maintenance, supplies, and stewards with everyone wearing multiple hats. You always feel a bit guilty being one of the few people assigned singular focus. There's a small desk that faces the door, but it's mostly ceremonial. You move towards it. Marcel greets you. Sit, sit, sit. You don't even have a chance to make it to the chair before she starts explaining, Hey, so that boy, he's got a flu or something, and it's probably infectious. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, to point out that my character seems to feel a bit, bit guilty about things a lot. <laughs> that keeps coming up. Um, I, I just don't think that there's anything to feel guilty about. I think you should just feel lucky and not worry about it. Um, flu or something, probably infectious. Uh, he just threw up almost all over me. Um... A uh, great what? I knew it. Say nothing. I don't know. Uh, I I'm just going to go with say nothing, I guess, because I don't know what to say. Um, uh, it probably won't matter. I'll say what, and then maybe we'll get more information. Marcel nods. I'm afraid so. She continues on. The symptoms were suppressed by the anti-nausea medicine. That's why his nausea came back. Sometimes someone sick slips through the tests, but you know we can't expose the employee's compromised immune systems to that kind of infection. She pauses, and you brace for the inevitable responsibility. We can't lock a synth play guy up, and we can't have them complaining. We gave him long-lasting anti-nausea meds and viral suppressants to both mask the symptoms and lessen the chance of the infection spreading, but it's just a band-aid. I've scheduled an early evacuation, but it won't be here for another two days. I'm counting on you to keep them all well-behaved and happy during that time. For real? For real. This just figures. You'll probably end up getting sick yourself and then quarantined. Let the steward see how much of a privilege your job is now. All right, let's see. Information. What am I supposed to do? When will he get better? I'd rather tell them the truth. What am I supposed to do? Well, do we care what he's got? I mean, I think this is the pertinent question of like, all right, what am I supposed to do? Like, what do you want me to do? Of course, she kind of already told me. Let's go with what's he got. Did I click it? No. Okay. Marcel seems surprised. Some kind of flu? 
here's the thing. I don't really care about the name of the virus. I just don't want things to get worse. And focusing on a diagnosis will just raise suspicion. Space Joy is only interested in evacuation. She scrunches her face at you. So please, don't raise suspicion. Okay, um, I'm going to go with what am I supposed to do? Michelle nods. You're the best of the best. Just do what you always do. Keep them happy. Keep them distracted. Keep them thinking that it's just a normal vacation. We told him that it may have been a bad reaction to what he ate, and there's no reason to tell him anything different. Now, I know you can do that. Um, I do want to know when will he get better. Michelle waves her hands. See, I, this is why I didn't ask it, because I figured she didn't care. Michelle waves her hands. Oh, who knows? We're just concerned about covering up the symptoms for now. He'll feel better by tomorrow morning. He just needs some sleep right now. Don't worry, he'll get plenty of rest when he gets back planet side. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather tell them the truth, but... I don't think she'll agree. This, this seems like the last thing to say. And if these are graying out as I go, let's see what we got. Oh, uh, no, I don't get it. Michelle sighs. Listen, I understand it can be stressful keeping secrets, but it's to prevent a panic, to give them a chance to enjoy what little time they have. Trust me on this. Or, you know, get yourself fired. Whatever. Her walkie-talkie starts vibrating, but she ignores it to give you one last bit of encouragement. Don't worry about it. I know you've got this. She smiles, then picks up the device. Ah, their dinner is ready. Round them up, dazzle them. Now I've got to go see to that poor boy and personally offer my condolences at the <clears throat> bad meal. Miss Elle adjusts her tie and brooch, gestures towards the door, and leaves in a huff. You can handle this. You can definitely handle this. You just have to keep them busy. All the time, busy. You relieve the steward who was covering for you. You've got this. You knock on each booth, informing them that the activity is officially over. Each one stumbles out, and then it's back to tourist crowd milling, just this time mixed with some eye rubbing. Some of them left their systems running, so you flip the master reset switch. You've got this. Probably. You fix your face into a sunbeam smile. So, who's hungry? <laughs> Geez, not me after all that puking. Uh, and people being sick and stuff. But I hope everybody else is hungry. Let's escort them to dinner. The day one dinner is always high quality. It's where the chefs show off how far spacefaring cuisine has come over the years thanks to engineered yeasts, specially designed ventilator ovens, and higher quality ingredients. It will be a diffusing meal once you get them there. But you can just feel their curiosity building. Their silence gives it away. Where is Grant? Why isn't he joining us for dinner? But you need to keep them distracted, focused on having a good time. Your best option at this point is just to smile and nod, smile and nod. But the silence is starting to bug you. Do you break it? If they're not actually saying anything, I think I'm just going to be calm and zen and move it along. And if they start talking, then I'll see what I can do. You go at the leisurely pace that tourists prefer, but you <laughs> deliberately avoid making eye contact or looking back at them. And then it happens. Hey, Trillian, are you going to join us again? Andre says. Wait, they want to spend more time with you? That's not what you expected. It's certainly not unpleasant, though. Maybe there wouldn't be any harm in pressing your luck. Uh, yeah, let's say sure. Let me just serve everyone first. It is my job. You still feel a bit bad about making another employee serve you like you were a guest before. Not again. You smile to the gums, but first things first, what would everyone like to eat? Everyone goes for the special of the vegetable empanadas and the Chilean replipork pork ragu. Ren and Sadri opt for the spicier versions. You get it all arranged and brought out. They seem pleasantly surprised at the inclusion of real forks and knives and plates. You carry over the last tray, your tray, and pause. Whose table should you join? Well... <clears throat> oh, it's a slightly different mix of people. Um, I think, um, I, um, I would have said like, let's go for Sadri and Ren, but 
and also Andres. Like, I thought it was going to split up the same way again. I don't know why. That was silly. Um, and that I wanted to go with Andres. So I'm, I'm going to follow that instinct and go over here. Hopefully you can just keep Andres and James distracted with the empty seat, considering that Grant won't be coming. James looks over the meal with a skeptical eye. Hopefully you can just keep Andres and James distracted with the empty seat, considering that Grant won't be coming. James looks over the meal with a skeptical eye. He turns to you critically. All of this is so much better than the lunch. Why even bother with that crap when you obviously can do better than the past? Andres flips over a fork in his hand. It's a hollow metal, which takes some getting used to. He turns to you. So, I know what I got out of it, but what do you think? Why does Space Joy have its tourists jump through the disgusting food hoop? Um, well... One of the things that, when, once he brought it up, I was think I was like, oh yeah, I see what you're doing. But it does seem like, um, sort of thematically, like when you first get there, you get the food you would have first gotten, you know, and then now we've progressed. So that makes sense. Um, and I do think that the tourists would sort of, I, again, living in Florida, one of the things is, um, where the space shuttle used to take off, you know, and you could go there and get the, like, um, freeze dried ice cream and stuff like that. And that was always a big kick that everybody enjoyed. So there's that. So it's the first two, I feel like, or three highlights how difficult the early space expeditions were, which is kind of the same thing about like start off roughing it and then get it better. It's a trick to get you to appreciate having the quality of things we can actually cook. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'll go with this. I'm overthinking it. James shrugs and throws in his own thoughts. I guess it was interesting to see what it used to be like. He smiles and turns intently to the ragu, intentionally leaving the vegetables for later. You try not to look judgmental. Andre stares at you intently. Ah, you haven't answered my question. That answers why Space Joy does it, but how do you feel about it? He cuts some of the pastry crust to balance it on his fork. Uh, well, I don't really care. <laughs> I just want everybody to be happy. Um, bad experiences help you appreciate the good ones. Suffering doesn't enhance enjoyment. Knowing what it means to suffer helps you appreciate the plight of others. Um, well, okay. So the first one is like, well, a bad lunch makes you appreciate a, a good dinner. Uh, and I just, yeah, I mean, that may be true, but I kind of feel like knowing what it means to suffer helps you appreciate the plight of others. Because in any of these museums where like, um, you see it, the, the local, um, museum here has a thing of really old fashioned houses, the first houses of the first settlers that were in this area. And the whole point of that is to go, look how hard it was for them. You know, they had to go, uh, you know, they had to live like this. <clears throat> so I think that's, I think that's what the point is. Andres opened some non-carbonated soda, perhaps, but wouldn't it be better to just work for the betterment of humanity? James turns. Well, I suppose there is some merit when it comes to putting yourself in a position to be better empathetic towards others. Andres huffs. It's a very base view of humanity to say that we need to suffer ourselves to recognize that others should be spared it. I think we can do better than that. James shakes his head, shrugging. Andres slowly dissects his ragu, inspecting it thoroughly. I bet that consultant kid has studied it. I bet he'd know what was what. They both look over at his empty chair. You tense up. Grant is definitely not going to make it to dinner. Here it comes. Andres waves your nerves away. No, don't worry about it. I've been thinking about him being sick as like a weird source of inspiration. Like what kind of game could you make out of someone being sick? Maybe an ER casual game where you can shock hearts and pump stomachs and stabilize bleeding. I think it'd be fun, but then I realized it was kind of wrong to go there, right? <laughs> Well, this is clearly in the future, and uh, there's already games like that, both of the silly kind and of the more uh, realistic kind. Um, I just wanted to say about this that I think he's right up to a point. Like, I don't need to be flogged or sold at an auction to know that that's a bad thing to have happen to other people, you know? But at the same time... Um, sometimes we dismiss things like, 
why do we need to have a department that's trying to make better food for the moon? Who cares? You know, or something like that. Like, why are we ma- wasting money on that? And to sort of show that, like, those little amenities actually add up when you're eating cube nut paste, you know, it's demoralizing. And so uh, it, there's actually a reason why we push forward in various ways, you know. Um, so I think in this case, he's a little bit wrong. Because I think it, there are some things that it is sort of easy to overlook of what people's lives are like in, in a different time or a different place um, that are just simple things that you wouldn't think of. And if you can just throw a few of those the tourist way, then, you know, that actually could increase their empathy and help them to understand why we do what we do. Sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but that just kind of stuck out at me. Um Okay, ER casual game. Um, this is his real question. Like, I don't feel like I want to, yeah, dodge it. Yeah. Andre smiles. Definitely. The games that speak to us the most are the ones where there's some meaning behind it, where there's something you can connect to. James Hedges. Well, you know, I'm just not sure that people would be able to really let loose and enjoy themselves in that kind of game. It's too morbid. Andres puts down his glass of blue liquor. I think the question comes down to this. Should we avoid making games out of the sadder parts of humanity? And if so, why? Um, he wouldn't have said it like a second grade teacher. I don't know why I did that, but, <laughs> um, hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I think, uh, it's the same as theater. You need to process. Shakespeare said we hold a mirror up to nature, you know, so we can help process it. Uh, and what we go through every day. Um, yeah. I do think the real test would be if people in hospitals liked it. In the sense that... You get that with some soldier games where soldiers are like, uh-uh, it ain't nothing like that, you know? <laughs> so that wouldn't do well. But I think this is the real answer. Making games like any art helps us deal with reality. Andres nods thoughtfully. Oh, I think it definitely helps take away death's sting... But is that necessarily a good thing? James frowns. And why does death deserve a sting? Hasn't it had that particular power for long enough? Andre sighs. I guess it's more involved than that. I mean, if we come to grips with death, with our own problems, then what motivates us to find solutions for them? When we accept hardship, we stop looking for ways to end it. Well, no, I don't. Hmm. That's an interesting thought. I'd never really thought about that. But I don't think that we ever, I mean, we have to come to grips with death. People keep dying. Like that's the people in your life will die. And that's a very difficult thing to move on and keep going from. It's really difficult. And I don't think as far as the sting, like, even if you're playing a game, even if you're watching plays or whatever, it, it may help you connect. I once sat through a play that was about a funeral that I wept through the whole thing because I had missed my grandmother's funeral and I was just like suddenly emotionally dealing with all that stuff. But it didn't take the sting out. It just gave me a place to process everything. So I don't, I don't think... I mean, if we sort of come to accept, like, say, cube nut paste, then maybe we wouldn't m be motivated to find a solution for that. But um, death? I mean, yeah. Hmm. Um, without levity, we'd be trapped in depression. Well, I, was it going to be funny? I never asked him about the mechanics. Was it going to be a comedy? need to be reminded of the consequences. No, I think... Come to grips with death. What motivate maybe games... I don't know. Let's go with that. That's the closest thing to processing it. James grins. I think that's true. We'd never be able to do anything. It's really too much for any one individual to bear. That's why we joke about the bugs we find. Andres pauses from cutting apart some repli pork. 
Well, yes, but we joke about them so that the entitled, complaining players get drowned out by our self-aware humor. It's a strategy to get players to just deal with the annoyance. James glares at Andres. Even if I joke, I still seriously care about them getting fixed. Andres shakes his head. I just think that we can be doing something better with our games. Better than just telling a story or being fun, we could be making a difference. Uh, okay, how would you do that? I think you are making a difference. Again, like, he keeps sort of conflating different things. Like, it was life and death, but now it's joking about bugs in a game. Like, that's not... <laughs> there. These are different levels of stakes, you know? Um... We could be making a difference. I think you are by helping us process. If we're talking about life and death, then you're helping me get through it. And that is making a difference in my own personal life. Um, but I want to see what he's talking about. Andres looks off. I'm not sure, but there must be a way that we can use our influence. James grins wholeheartedly. I think we'll figure it out. We've got the expertise. We'll figure out a way. I know it. He finishes off his drink and looks around. You realize somewhat suddenly that everyone's finished. You spring to, somewhat embarrassed at being caught off guard. You revert quickly into professional mode, solidifying your smile. I hope everyone enjoyed dinner. Now there's an hour of free time, and then it is lights out for the rest of the staff. You are free to stay up, of course, and if you need anything at all, you pause a little longer than necessary. I will always be on call. The tourists filter out and thank you for the delicious food. Now it is time to focus on the dishes, and then your time is your own. That bad ending has been bothering you all day, and you'd really like to figure it out before the designers leave. All right. Well, we got into some, like, again, big discussions about art and its purpose and all of that, but I, I felt like that got a little muddled somehow because like i said the stakes of what we were talking about kept rising and falling and rising and falling and so it was hard to agree or disagree with everything when everything in the world was being sort of lumped together so that was a little bit of a confusing conversation but i have a feeling the way that james jumped in and was like i still care about fixing the bugs and then later said i know we can do it and stuff kind of made me feel like some of that may have been like I'm just coming into a conversation that they've already been having and part of that is arguing about work and part of that is arguing about art and uh, and I'm just dropped into it. Um, my folks have a tendency to do that where all of a sudden they'll just say to you like, do you believe in evil? And it turns out that they've been having this conversation uh, for a couple of hours on the car on the way over, you know, talking about, I don't know, the nature of evil or something. And then they just, like, out of the blue decide to bring me into it, <laughs> you know, where I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> They've totally caught me off guard. And, like, their conversation, uh, the things that they say to me then will sort of encapsulate this longer conversation that they've already had. And it's a little hard for me to follow. Um because they're almost speaking in a shorthand. And I kind of feel like that was going on with Andres and James. Like I had walked into something that was already ongoing and they weren't necessarily explaining themselves fully uh, because they had already been through it. So I don't know. Very interesting. Uh, and I'm looking forward to our relaxing time because we are going to go play some more creatures such as we, I hope. I don't know what comes next, but that's the little bit of a teaser there and um i kind of miss playing our video game and describing all of that so uh we'll see you back here for episode six in the meantime be well